Hello everyone. Welcome to this lecture on machine learning and deep learning fundamentals and applications. In this lecture, I am going to walk you through a few programming examples on machine learning and deep learning. The goal of this lecture is to get you acquainted with the practical implementations of the concepts that has been taught to you in this course. Uh, this uh, examples are going to be on four machine learning algorithms and a custom made CNN that is convolution neural network algorithm. Now, uh, this is going to be a basic demonstration. You can definitely work on it and prepare your own complex code uh, and get the results there uh, as your journey progresses in the field of machine learning and deep learning. So, let us start the class. So, this is going to be the content of today's lecture. First, we will be talking about why we are using Python as the uh, environment for programming this machine learning and deep learning algorithms. Then we will talk about the use of Colab, which is uh, basically used for accessing the free GPUs that is being provided to you by uh, Google and uh, we can definitely make use of this free GPUs that has been provided to us. And after that, I am showing the practical implementation of these four machine learning algorithms. They are uh, linear regression, k-means clustering, k-n classification and SVM classification. And after that, we, I will show you the custom CNN classification algorithm. So now, why Python? So you see here in the middle of this slide, I have written a code in C to print the statement hello world. Now you see here, in order to print this statement, I am writing three lines of codes. The first line is uh, to initialize the header for library and then I am using this main function here and then I am writing the statement within this curly braces. Now since this is a function, I have to return this 0. Right. Now see, just to print this single statement, I am writing 4 uh, lines of codes. So this is becoming a cumbersome affair. Think what would be the scenario when we would be coding for ML algorithms and deep learning algorithms. But this is not the case for Python. So, when we are uh, printing a statement using Python, we just have to write print hello world. So, you see here, there is no specific requirements needed. And most importantly, the syntax of Python is similar to uh, the English language. And also, it allows the coder or developer to write uh, codes in fewer lines. And on top of that, we have a very strong support system uh, on the net. So, if we have any issue or if we encounter any uh, error during coding, if we uh, write that issue or that error in the net in certain platforms, we will instantly get the reply as a, as a solution. So, it makes life easier for our uh, coders as well as the developers. So, these are the reasons why we have chosen Python. Now, after this, let us see uh, how to use Colab. Now, we are using Colab because um, Google provides us with a um, few resources, uh, that is some GPUs where we can train our model. Now this makes life easier for us because it reduces the training time of our algorithm. And one important thing is that in order to um, use Colab, we need to have a um, Gmail account in Google. So before starting Colab, just sign in to the G Google uh, or the Gmail account. And after that, type Colab in Google. After that, we see this page appearing in front of us. So here, we just have to click on this link that is welcome to collaboratory and then this window pops up in front of you. Now in this window, we have this button here that is new notebook. So if we click on this, this layout appears in front of us. So this is similar to the Jupyter notebook layout. So here we see the cell. So, we will be coding our uh, algorithms in this location and then we can just uh, change the file name here. Now, initially we won't be provided the access to the Google servers. So, in order to access the GPUs, we first have to click on this runtime button and then in this drop down menu, we just need to select change runtime type. After clicking on that, this window pops up in front of us. Now, when we select this button here that is the T4 GPU and click on save, we see that the T4 name appears on the top right corner of your notebook. Now this assures that you have selected the GPU. Now 
you just have to connect to the servers by clicking on this button. Um, before that, I like to uh, draw attention to one of the uh, icons here in this notebook. You see this icon here. So this icon is basically uh, used to access the content of the collab. So this is how the content appears. So this space uh, is provided by collab where you can upload or down or save certain models or specific uh, files uh, to you the Google collab uh, storage place uh, temporarily. Now why this temporarily? Uh, it is because once you log out or log off from the session, this content uh, space deletes. So what I mean to say is that all the files that you have uploaded or you have saved in this content, it would be deleted. So if you want certain things to get saved or uh, you want to retain something, you either have to copy it to your Google Drive or you need to download it. All right. So this, the things that are stored here are temporary. Now, there would be certain files that uh, you would like uh, to access from your Google Drive. Mostly the datasets that you have uh, created or you have downloaded. So those datasets would be residing in Google Drive. So in order to access those files, you just have to click on this icon. So this icon basically uh, mounts your Google Drive. So when you click on that, this window appears in your screen. Uh, asking for your permission to access the Google Drive files. And after that, you click on this button here. Once you do that, you see here in the content space, this drive folder appears. And also the icon uh, which you click to mount the Google Drive is crossed out. So this means that the drive has been um, accessed or you are able to access the drive now and it has been uploaded to your content space. And one more important thing that I would like to draw your attention. Once your notebook is connected to the Google servers, you will see a green tick here with the RAM in this space shown in this portion of your notebook. All right. So now uh, the Google Collab is uh, almost ready. Now you just have to write your codes in this cells. And if you want more cells, you just have to click on this button here. So it will insert a new cell or also you can just hover your mouse pointer at this location and then this buttons would uh, pop up. And when this button pops up, you just click on this code button and a new cell would reappear. And the third option is you can just go to this insert button in this bar, uh, click on it, then a drop down menu appears through which you can just insert a cell. So now you can start coding with Colab. Now let's move on to the next slide where I am um, actually implementing a linear regression problem. So what I'm doing here is that at first I'm importing a matplotlib.pyplot library. So this library basically helps us to plot different uh, graphs or curves. So what we have here is a list that contains the ages of uh, 13 cars, which has been assigned to the variable x. And then we have a second list which contains the respective speeds of these 13 cars uh, when they pass through a toll gate. And this list is assigned to the variable y. Now what we are doing, we are using this uh, PLT object that contains the matplotlib.pyplot library. And using the scatter plot function, we are plotting the x and y. And this is the diagram that we got. So you see here, these are the dots that represents x and y. Now, in order to fit the line, I am taking help of the SkyPy library. From, who, from this SkyPy library, I am just importing this stats.lineRegress function. Now, what it does is that it just fits a line uh, to the points that has been assigned to us or that we have at our disposal. So, we are sending the x and the y coordinates of the points and giving it to stats.lineRegress, which fits the line for us. Now, as a result, or uh, in return, it sends five arguments or five parameters out of which we are going to use only two. So these are slope and intercept. The remaining three we are just going to ignore. That's why uh, we are using underscore in their place. After that, we are just defining a function here. The name of the function is 
my func and it accepts one argument that is x and then it returns the value which is obtained by performing the function slope into x plus intercept so this is basically m x plus c so this is the equation of the line now in the next line of code we are just assigning an empty uh, list to y1 and then we are running uh, a for loop to the entire length of x after that each value in x is sent to the function my func and this value is calculated that is mx plus c and it is stored in the variable value and after that we are just appending this value to y1 so at the end we will have a list y1 whose length is going to be 13 all right okay now we are just plotting the original points uh, which is given by x y and its color is kept blue and after that we are plotting the line that we have fitted or obtained through this line dot uh, line degrees uh, function so it is given by plot dot uh, plt dot plot x comma y1 and we see the regress line here so line fitted all right so we have obtained our uh, result here so this is the final outcome of the uh, linear regression process now let's come to the unsupervised machine learning algorithm that is k means clustering so in this case i am just using another um, library that is numpy so it helps us to work with arrays and then we have this matplotlib library which help us to plot and then we have uh, two uh, variables which contains two lists and now we are uh, just cataploting this x and y and this is the output here subsequently what we are doing we are just zipping x and y so that we can form a coordinate so that coordinate would contain one value from x and one value from y and we are just uh, displaying it using print data so you can see the output here so this is the output so you see one value from x and the other value from y now we will do the k-means clustering on these points so for k-means clustering i am taking help of the k-means function that has been already given to us by the library sklearn.cluster now what we are doing we are creating an object k-means using this k-means function and we are sending n cluster as the argument so n cluster uh, will determine how many clusters we want as output so in this case i am using two all right but you can definitely play with this cluster value um, and see how it performs now one thing is that in this uh, data you see we can make out that this is going to be one cluster and the other one is this one so it is easier for uh, us by just visually looking at it but in real world scenarios this is not going to be the case all right but let's see this uh, let's consider this because our goal is to just learn how to use this algorithm we are not looking into the complexities all right so okay so now once this k-means object is created we are just fitting the data here and then we are plotting the xy uh, xy values but this time what we are going to do we are going to assign the points that belong to a particular cluster with a single color the points that belong to the other cluster with a different uh, color so that would be taken care of by c equal to k means dot levels all right now you see here the points belonging to cluster one are level uh, or colored yellow and the points that belongs to the other cluster are level with a uh, blue color so this is the second cluster now i talked about this number right this cluster number so this cluster number won't be easy to uh, initialize at first so if you want to get a proper method how to uh, initialize this cluster you can look at this elbow method so it is in the next slide so this is the elbow method so what it does is that it finds out how many uh, number of clusters are possible that is the minimum and the maximum value so if we are having 10 points here so maximum value of the cluster is going to be 10 and the minimum is going to be 1 right so that's why we are running a for loop uh, from 1 to 10 all right and we are just calling in the x-means function here 
and sending n clusters is equal to 1. So, we will be iterating it till it reaches 10, alright. And for each object k means we will be fitting the data and then we are just appending the value of k means dot inertia to inertias. So, this variable is uh, initialized here. So, inertias was initially a empty list and after appending it uh, or running it for 10 times, uh, we would be getting a list containing 10 elements or 10 scalar values, alright. Now, you might be wondering what this k means dot inertia is all about. Now, this inertia is sum of the squared distance of the samples to their closest cluster center, alright. And after we are done calculating this, we are just simply plotting this inertia here in this line. And this is the output we got. So, you see here clearly in this plot, there is an elbow at this point. So, this is the discontinuity because this part is linear and this part also we can consider almost linear, right. But the discontinuity is occurring at this position. So, we are choosing 2 as the optimal number of uh, clusters. Alright, so this is a technique to determine how many clusters we should be picking up for the distribution of data that we have at our hand. Uh, one important thing that I forgot to mention is the use of this library here. So we are importing this library that is uh, warnings so that we can ignore the warnings that occurs while executing this code. Now in this case uh, you see few of the warnings would appear but those uh, warnings are not detrimental to the execution of the program. Now, since these are not detrimental, so we can just simply ignore them and that is what we are doing in this line, alright. So, let us move on to the next uh, algorithm here. So, that is KNN classification. So, this is K nearest neighbor classification and for this we are importing three libraries. One is NumPy which help us to work with arrays, then we have the matplotlib library which help us to plot and the other one is uh, pandas. So, this library helps us to work with tabular data. Alright. Now, we are taking help of the sklearn library and importing the data set function and this helps us to load the iris data set. So, now this iris data set consists of flowers basically the iris flowers. So, this contains 150 samples and contains 3 levels which means 3 classes, alright. Now, these 3 classes are basically the species of iris which are iris setosa, iris virginica and iris versicolor and each sample here has 4 features. They are sepal length, sepal width, petal length and petal width and these values are in centimeters, alright. So, once the entire data set is loaded into this uh, variable, we are just segregating it into data and levels. So, it is shown in these two lines and after this, we are just using this train test split to split it into training set and testing set, alright. So, the what would be the ratio for dividing it would be determined by this. So, we are considering 25 percent of the total training uh, set as testing set and the remaining 75 percent would be considered as the training set and this is stored in these four variables, alright. So, these variables contains um, x train and x test which contains the training and the testing data respectively and y train and y test contains the testing um, sorry training and the testing uh, levels respectively. Now, here I am using another function that is standard scalar uh, which I have imported from sklearn dot preprocessing. So, this is basically used to standardize our data. standard is our data. So, what it does is that it makes mean 
of the distribution 0 and the standard deviation as 1 all right so this is what is being done in these two lines so we are just standardizing the x string and the y test data storing it in these two variables and after that um, we are using this k neighbor classifier function that has been uh, already present in this library that is sklearn.neighbors and we are creating a classifier object here so in this object we are just sending how many numbers of neighbors we are considering so that is what is the value of k that this is going to be so that we have chosen as 5 and we are using metric minkowski and p equal to 2 so this basically uh, considers the distance as standard Euclidean distance so the metric that we will be using to calculate the five neighbors would be the Euclidean distance so that is the meaning of this metric and p value all right so once this classifier is uh, constructed we are just fitting it with x train and y train just because it is a, a supervised learning technique all right and once the learning is done we are just predicting the x test value which is being stored in this variable y pred now the y pred is printed here so y pred contains the levels of the text data and in order to show it in a more um, uh, visually appealing manner or you can say more informative manner we are using the confusion matrix so confusion matrix is a function that is uh, being imported from the sklearn dot um, matrix and then we are sending this to as the arguments and this cm variable will contain the confusion matrix which being shown in this place and also we are uh, calculating the accuracy score so that is provided here so we are getting an accuracy of 94.70 percent so that is really a good accuracy here and you might be saying here that in most of the algorithms or in in this algorithm only we are using uh, the sklearn library quite a lot so this sklearn library is very important when we talk about ml and dl algorithms okay so you need to know about this uh, library after this i'm just uh, showing the real values and the predicted values in a tabular format so i am using this pandas function to show it in a tabular format and you see here the green or uh, sorry the blue rectangles which shows the misclassified data so now you see here this is the true data and this is the predicted data so this should not have been predicted as one it should have been predicted as two but yeah this is the misclassification that we got from this classifier so there are three instances here and i'm just showing you 23 samples here because the other samples i could not fit into this slide so when you try it out on your own you will get a bigger table all right so this is all about the k nearest neighbor algorithm now let's move on to the another uh, supervised machine learning classification technique uh, that uses svm that is support vector machine so like uh, i used in knn here also i'm using three libraries that is numpy matplotlib pandas and also i'm using the sklearn uh, library to load the iris data set here so this is being done here the loading of iris data set and then i'm just uh, splitting the train and the test using this line and then i'm just standardizing the data using this code so this is similar to the one that we did in knn and after that i am importing this function svc that is support vector classifier from sklearn.svm and creating the classifier object here so here we are sending the kernel as linear so we are considering linearly separable data that's why kernel is linear and the random status zero and then we are fitting the x train and y train data so the learning process is going to take place in this step so once this is done we are predicting the test uh, data so it is done in this step and we are just um, assigning the values of this uh, step to the variable y pad and this is shown in this portion so this is the levels that we have predicted and to show it in a more readable manner or more informative manner we are using this confusion matrix here and also we are showing the accuracy score so now if you look at this value here accuracy score is 97.36 percent and this is the confusion matrix so you see here that um, the accuracy is more in case of uh, svm compared to knn so svm is a better classifier for this data set 
that's what we can conclude and this is the tabular form that I am showing so for uh, real values I am showing this column and for the predictive values I am showing this column and you see there is only one instance where we are having a misclassification all right so these are the machine learning techniques that uh, we are going to discuss in this class now we move on to the deep uh, learning algorithm uh, which is the convolution neural network so we are going to do a classification task in this case so here also we are using this library numpy and then we are using a new library that is tensorflow now this tensorflow is a python friendly open source library for numerical computation that makes machine learning and developing neural networks faster and easier so we are going to import a few functions from this tensorflow that is keras and another one is layers now this keras.dataset.mnist is used to load the mnist dataset so mnist dataset is a 10 class uh, classification dataset which contains the images of uh, the digits that is from 0 to 9 so now this data set would be loaded into this variables now here we do not have to do the train test split because it is already been splitted uh, by this uh, the function that is keras.dataset all right now after we have loaded it to these variables what we are doing we are taking the x train and the x test and we are just changing the data type of this uh, values or this variables that is we are converting it into float 32 and float 32 here and after that we are dividing it by 255 so this is basically the normalization step so this is done so that the scale of the image um, comes between the range 0 and 1 so that we maintain a uniformity there and 255 because this is the highest possible value that we can obtain for a 8-bit image all right and uh, after that we are just expanding the dimension of uh, this images now the important thing is that when we consider grayscale image it always has height as well as width but no channel all right so when we are working with CNNs or TensorFlow or the PyTorch library, they always expect that we have a channel associated with an image. Now, since there are no channel associated with a grayscale image, we are just including one here. All right, so making it a 3D tensor. All right. In case of color images, you always have H, W, and channel. So this channel is going to be three because we have red green and blue channels that comprises the color image so therefore in order to get a channel there we are just expanding the dimension of the images by using np.expanddims and we are using axis as minus one so minus one means it will be expanding in the last dimension okay so the similar thing is being done for the x test as well all right now we are printing the x train shape so you can see it over here so it says 60,000 comma 28 comma 28 comma 1 so 60,000 is the batch size batch 28 is the height this 28 is the width and this one is the number of channels all right and before this I just forgot about this initialization part so here I am initializing two variables so one is uh, number of class which is assigned as 10 because we are doing a 10 class classification problem and the input shape of each image is going to be 28 comma 28 comma 1 so this one is for the channel and 28 and 28 are for height and width of that image all right now in the final steps of this cell what I am doing I am trying to categorize or convert the numerical data into categorical data now what actually it is so if your numer if you consider numerical data and suppose say a level is or suppose say a image is level less 2 so in numerical it has the level 2 all right 
So, in categorical what would be the result? The result would be zero, 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 zero. So you see here, all the values that belongs to the other classes would be uh, numbered as zero, and the place that belongs to two would be numbered as one. Now you might be wondering why not consider this place because in python the counting always starts from 0 ok alright so since this level was 2 so we are going to the third place that is 0 1 2 and in the third place we are just assigning 1 and the rest will be having 0 so this is the categorical form so this helps in increasing the speed um, for our algorithm so that is the reason that's why we are considering categorical and it also has other benefits so which i'm not going to cover in this um, lecture all right so we have converted into uh, a list which contains zeros and one and one is only for that uh, place uh, for which we have the level all right okay so now we are forming the model in this portion so we are considering a sequential model here which i have uh, imported from the keras function here which we have imported in our previous slide so this sequential basically helps us to um, stack the layers one after the other in a sequential fashion so what we are doing here is we are importing this keras dot input layer and we are sending in the input shape here so this is the first layer and after that we have a convolution layer here con2d which contains 32 filters each of kernel size 3 cross 3 and the activation function is relu so the nonlinearity function is going to be or in being introduced by the relu function and after that i have the max pooling layer which has a pool size of 2 cross 2 now the important thing is that after its convolution we are uh, introducing this max pooling that's because we want to reduce the uh, spatial dimension of the incoming feature map all right and since we are uh, reducing the spatial dimension in the next convolution layer we are increasing the number of filters so that we can encode more information all right so this is just increasing the receptive field of the input uh, or the incoming feature map so here we are having 64 filters with the kernel size of 3 cross 3 and the activation is going to be the relu same as the previous case and then again we have another max pooling layer here all right and after that we are just flattening the incoming feature map so this is like vectorizing the incoming feature map and after that we are passing it through a dropout layer and then we are moving it to the dense layer which we can consider as the output layer so in this case we are having 10 nodes because we have 10 classes and the activation this time is going to be the softmax because it gives us probability values and the class which is having the max maximum probability would be assigned as accordingly so the class with the maximum probability is going to be considered as the predicted class all right and this dropout layer is basically used for regularization so that we do not have overfitting issues and in this case we are going to drop out 50 percent of the uh, nodes all right and after creating this model you see here we are just printing the model lot summary here and this is the entire model so we have the layers here so we see con 2d max pooling con 2d max pooling flatten drop out and finally the dense layer which is the output layer and then we have the sa output save here that is the saves of the uh, feature map the saves of the outgoing feature map and then we have the parameters here all right uh, and when we sum these parameters here we get the total parameters here so total number of training parameters are 34826 all right so this is fairly a very small model uh, when you will be working with deep learning algorithms you will see that uh, the models are having millions of parameters 
all right but this is just for the demo purpose so i am creating a, a small network here all right and you might be wondering what this none is all about so this none is related to the batch size okay so since now we have just uh, made the skeleton of the model we are not providing any information related to the batch so that's why we are uh, getting it as none all right okay then now let's come to this uh, so for the batch size we have considered 128 and number of epochs we have considered 15 so what is this epoch so epoch is one complete pass of the training data set through the algorithm all right now we cannot just send in the entire data set to the model it will just load the model right so we are working in batches so in this case we are working on a batch of 128 now let me explain it to you through an example suppose we have 10 samples So these are the 10 samples. So now let's consider that we have a batch size of 2. So what it means is that we will be working on 2 samples at a time. All right. Then we will continue working on it like this. So after 5 iterations, the entire training set will be complete. And this is called 1 epoch. All right, so there would be 15 epochs as I have already shown here. And after that, what we are doing, we are just configuring the model using model.compile. And here we are using the loss function as categorical cross entropy. And then we have the Adam optimizer for optimization. And the metric that we would be monitoring in this case is the accuracy. All right, after that, we are just um, fitting the model here. Um, where we are sending in the X train, the Y train and the batch size here and also the epochs and after that we are doing the validation split which is 10% here. So now this the entire training set will be uh, split into two parts, uh, one containing the training set and another containing the uh, validation set. Now this validation set is required so that we can fine tune the model uh, at each epoch alright and since uh, we are using 15 epochs you see the progress of the model for the 15 epochs here so we have the training loss training accuracy validation loss validation accuracy here all right so these are the value we see the loss is gradually decreasing here and um, the accuracy is gradually increasing here so it is decreasing and this is increasing same goes for validation loss as well it is decreasing gradually and it is increasing gradually for the validation accuracy and I have also shown it in a graphical um, plot so you see here the training and the validation uh, accuracy are consistently increasing and the loss is consistently decreasing now when does the problem arise now suppose this validation loss starts to increase from this point like this so this would be a case of overfitting which we do not want for our model all right so if overfitting occurs we need to look um, or maybe change the model or maybe work with the number of layers or maybe introduce some regularization technique so overfitting is something that we don't want for our model all right so we can say that after uh, eight epoch it is going to overfit if this is the case all right now since this is not the case for here so we can say that this is basically a perfect model that we are training here all right okay so now here i am just evaluating the model by sending in the x test and the y test and i am just showing the uh, test accuracy and the test loss here so the test loss is 2.54 percent and the test accuracy is 99.08 percent here so it is a really good performing model and after that i'm just predicting the model um, for the x test data and we are showing it in this variable prdt now initially since uh, we have converted the, the levels into categorical form we need to convert it back into the numerical form so that we can uh, see the confusion matrix for this data so this is what we are doing here we are just finding the um, maximum position where it is occurring and so we are using np.argmax and then 
we are assigning it to the variable y pred. Similarly, for the ground truth data, we are doing np.argmax for y test and storing it in y class variable. And then we are sending in the y class and y pred, which is the ground truth and the predicted uh, value uh, to the confusion matrix, and we are obtaining the confusion matrix here. So, you can see directly this is the confusion matrix here and we are also plotting the accuracy score or oh sorry we are printing the uh, accuracy score. So, this is the accuracy score here alright. So, you can see that uh, the CNN performs much better than the other machine learning algorithms though we are using separate data set but you see here in this case we use the 10 class uh, data set in the previous case that is the machine learning case we use the 3 class data set and in spite of that we are getting a better performance alright and in this case I am just trying to show the confusion matrix in a more visually appealing manner uh, by using this uh, library that is seaborn.hitmap alright so this I have imported here. So you see what is the output of this seaborn heatmap so this is what we get as the output so you see here the diagonal elements are shown in light color to show that this has got the higher values as we can make it out from the color bar and the non diagonal elements are having low values which is good for us and this is shown in the color bar here alright. So this is uh, visually more appealing um, diagram for the confusion matrix. So you can definitely use the C1 packets uh, to get things more visually appealing alright. So in this class we talked about Colab how to use it and how to access the GPUs that is being provided to us by Google and then we talked about uh, four ML algorithms and they are linear regression, uh, k-means clustering, k-nearest neighbor and SVM that is support vector machine and out of this KNN and SVM are classification algorithms. After that we have also tried the CNN a custom made convolution neural network uh, which perform very good for a 10 class classification problem. Now this is just the basic demonstration of uh, this algorithms and I hope that you uh, got an idea of how to practically implement this um, ML and DL algorithms and you can definitely explore the other complex algorithms in this field that is the ML algorithms and the deep learning algorithms and see how it performs for those cases. I hope you learned something from this class and you enjoyed this class and with this note I conclude today's lecture. Thank you and have a great day.